We'll come to order. Thank you all for being here. Today's hearing will examine rental car safety, an issue that has received a great deal of attention over the past decade. Currently, there is no federally mandated obligation for rental car companies to repair safety defects following a safety recall. Legislation we will examine today would change that. In 2004, sisters Rachel and Jacqueline Hawk were killed when driving a rental car that had been recalled for a power steering hose defect that had not been repaired. The car caught fire while traveling on the highway, causing a loss of steering and a head-on collision with a semi-trailer truck. Today's hearing is the result of several years of hard work by my colleagues, by the rental car industry, and by consumer advocates, including Callie Hawk, the mother of Rachel and Jacqueline, who has dedicated so much time and energy to ensuring that other mothers do not suffer through the tragedy that she experienced. When a version of this bill was first introduced nearly two years ago, the rental car industry was adamantly opposed. They wanted to make their own decisions about how and when to ground their vehicles. Long, intense negotiations led us to the point where we are today with agreement between the key stakeholders. Last September, after months of negotiations, the four leading rental companies, Enterprise, Hertz, Avis, Budget, and Dollar Thrifty, and the Industries Trade Association agreed to support legislation to address recalls. And they all agreed to voluntarily comply with the requirements of the bill until the legislation could be enacted into law. I thank the industry for its earnest efforts to reach agreement commitment to this process, and particularly for the continued efforts to see legislation enacted. Senator Schumer and Boxer's Bill 921, the Rachel and Jacqueline Hauck Safety Car Rental, Safe Rental Car Act of 2013, reflects that agreement. The bill establishes clear requirements for rental car companies and allows NHTSA to pursue enforcement action for violations. The bill would apply the standard to all companies engaged in renting cars because consumers rightly expect and deserve the same level of safety no matter where they are renting a car. This is not a new concept. The Motor Vehicle Safety Act already requires auto dealers to remedy any safety recalls before selling or leasing a new car. Senate Bill 921 simply applies that same standards not just to sold cars or leased cars but also to rental cars. Over the past several years, bills have been introduced in at least two state legislatures and discussed in other states attempting to ground rental cars sub subject to recall. I have heard from the rental car industry and agree that this and other sa auto safety issues are best handled at the federal level rather than creating a patchwork of state laws for the industry to navigate. By enacting this agreement into law, we can set a federal standard for safety. Today, we will hear from NHTSA about the agency's investigation into rental car companies' practices when it comes to repairing recall vehicles. As the agency responsible for implementing and enforcing the standards created in Senate Bill 921, we will also hear the agency's thoughts on the bill. We will hear from the American Car Rental Association, the Trade Association for the Rental Car Industry, on the actions the industry has taken to voluntarily improve its practices and the industry's support for the legislation that would codify those practices the advocacy group Consumers for Automobile Reliability and Safety, spearhead, previously spearheaded efforts to enact legislation on this issue in California, and has since shifted those efforts to Congress. We will hear from them on their work with the rental car industry to reach an agreement on this legislation. Despite the agreement reached between the rental companies and auto safety advocates, two separate but related industries have raised concerns about the impacts they believe the bill could have on them if it were to be enacted. The auto manufacturers, represented today by the Auto Alliance, have serious concerns about the liability that could be created, created through a mandate to ground vehicles. I am sympathetic to this concern, believe it can be addressed, and look forward to hearing their proposals for doing so. The National Automobile Dealers Association has also raised concerns about the bill applying to auto dealers who rent cars, especially since dealers are already required to remedy a recall before they sell or lease a new car. I'm struggling to see why the same standard would be so problematic for dealers to adhere to for the cars they rent. However, I look forward to hearing the industry's thoughts on how their concerns could be addressed. Before we get to our witnesses today, we will first hear from Callie Hawk, who has worked tirelessly on this issue. We were also supposed to hear from Senator Schumer, but due to scheduling conflicts, he will not be able to join us today. He will instead submit his statement for the record. I also ask unanimous consent that the statements and letters of support from a coalition of consumer groups, Enterprise, Hertz, 
Avis Budget, AAA, State Farm, the Truck Renting and Leasing Association, the Trauma Foundation, and Congresswoman Lois Capps be entered into the record. I hope to have a productive discussion today that leads to the enactment of common sense legislation for the stakeholders represented today, and most importantly, for the consumers. Senator Heller. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you, uh, Chairman McCaskill, for holding this hearing today. I want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank everybody in the audience for uh, taking time this morning. I want to start by extending my condolences to you, Ms. Houck. Uh, we all know the origins of this issue, and I want to personally thank you for your testimony today and for the insight that you will provide for this hearing. I also want to apologize. Uh, there was some scheduling miscommunications between the full committee and staff, and I'll not be able to stay long today. However, um, I will be reviewing the hearing. S-921, the Rachel and Jacqueline Houck Safe Rental Car Act of 2013 will codify an agreement made by the auto rental industry to stop renting or selling vehicles that are under a safety recall before they are fixed. Among other things, the legislation provides rulemaking authority to NHTSA that will mandate all rental car companies have 24 to 48 hours to pull the vehicle subject to recall from their fleet. The legislation also gives NHTSA the authority to investigate and monitor the recall practices of rental car companies. The legislation has the support of large rental car companies, insurance companies, and consumer and safety groups, some of which are represented here today. Because this legislation turns a voluntary agreement into a mandate, there are some who have raised concerns, and I understand they're also represented here also. This hearing today is important to listen to all sides in this debate and inform members of this committee and the Senate on the details of this legislation. Again, I appreciate the chairwoman for holding this hearing, and I look forward to the testimonies and reviewing the information received from all the panelists today. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to vouch for Senator Heller and that we did have some scheduling issues, and we're all doing our best here. I don't want anybody to interpret him having to leave as a lack of concern for the subject matter. Yeah, that's great. Um, would you like to make a statement? I would, yes. Senator Boxer. Senator McCaskill, thank you so much for this, Senator Heller as well. On October 7, 2004, my constituent, Callie Houck, who we will hear from, lost her two beautiful daughters, Rachel, 24, and Jacqueline, age 20. And I want everyone to remember, that's why she is here. This is what happened to her, and this is what could happen to any of our families if we don't act. And anyone standing in the way of this legislation ought to think about it if this had happened to their children, their grandchildren, their niece, their nephew. So I'm going to keep coming back to that. Now, this accident was caused by an unrepaired safety defect in the rental car they were driving. I have a picture of the girls. Now, if it wasn't for Callie, who, who is an incredible woman, you'll soon see, Senators, they never would have really found out why this happened. And I hope that in her testimony she will explain. If she doesn't, I want her to, because we can't question her because we have to move on to another panel. What she did, because she's an attorney, is to, is to do discovery on her own until she found out why this happened. And so... I want to say, you know, life moves in mysterious ways, but because of her work, it's very possible if we do our job, this will never happen to anyone else. So for the last year and a half, when I got to know Kelly, of course, I couldn't stop thinking about how we needed to do this, and I was fortunate to find such great partners in the Senate, Senator Schumer, McCaskey, McCaskill, and others, and the Rachel and Jacqueline Houck safe Rental Car Act is a result of very, very long negotiation. Throughout this process, Congresswoman Lois Capps, who is the Congresswoman of Cali Haug, has, has also worked very hard on this. I'm pleased consumer safety organizations, the rental car industry, have come together to support this legislation. And I want to say it's pretty simple. You know, when anyone tells you something's complicated, just know 
that they're just trying to get you not to think about it. This is very simple. It says rental car companies may not rent or sell unsafe recall vehicles until they're repaired. So those of you who are going to come up here and say, oh, this is terrible, think again. Maybe you'll think again. Because the bottom line here is if you went out on the street, I say to my dear colleagues, and you asked anyone here or in Nevada or in Missouri or in my state, if there was such a law that says you can't rent a car out that's been recalled, everyone would say, of course there's a law. Why would it be treated differently than anything else? It's common sense safety. It just makes a lot of sense. Now, I want you to know, because this bill has been slow walked, I decided it was important for the major rental car companies to do this on their own. So on May 7, 2012, I wrote to the major rental car companies asking them to sign on to a pledge. This is the pledge. Effective immediately, our company is making a permanent commitment to not rent or sell any vehicles under safety recall until the defect has been remedied. I thank Hertz from the bottom of my heart. They stepped out, they took the lead, and they signed that pledge word for word. The other companies have improved their policies. But while these voluntary efforts are fine, we need permanent legislation to hold these companies accountable. I want to conclude by again thanking Callie Howe, who is testifying. In the face of her unthinkable personal tragedy, losing the light of her life, and I asked my colleagues, look at this, it could be our kids. She found the strength and the determination that I find inspiring. Without her incredible advocacy and work to protect consumers, we would not have gotten this far. We have a lot of work ahead of us. I worry that the special interests will pound and pound and make this something that it isn't. But I got to just tell them if they're out there, I don't know if you are, that I, for one, I'm going to be going all over this country on this one with Callie. And I'm just going to be saying, what are they doing to you? Because this is common sense safety legislation. And I intend to work with my colleagues, and anyone who knows Claire McCaskill and Chuck Schumer and myself and Lois and others, I'll tell you, they know we're going to be dogged about it. Because when I make a commitment to someone who lost the center of their life, I don't take it lightly. With that, I would yield, and I thank uh, the chairman. Thank you, Senator Boxer. And now we'll hear from Callie Hawk. today. I'd just like to thank <clears throat> Senator Schumer for authoring this legislation named for my daughters Rachel and Jacqueline and to Senators Murkowski, Blumenthal, Gillibrand, Casey and Schatz and my own Senators Barbara Boxer and Diane Feinstein and you Madam Chair for your co-sponsorship of this important consumer legislation. I especially thank you Senator Schumer and Senator Boxer and your staffs for your hard work and leadership on this issue. I appreciate the rental car industry for working with us for the past two years to resolve this issue. I'm pleased to say that all the major rental car companies now support this legislation. I especially thank Hertz for being the standard bearer. And finally, I'd like to thank all of the consumer groups who have supported this effort particularly consumers for auto reliability and safety. On October 7th, 2004, after a four-day visit south to see the family, my girls hugged me goodbye with words of love and appreciation. Rachel had just returned from two years in Italy, and I was so proud of them for their conscientious and passionate look on life. Rachel had to work that evening, and they wanted to stop and see friends before heading out to drive back to Santa Cruz. I tell them to drive safe and call me. 
Jackie said she'd see me in a few weeks when she was scheduled to fly from Los Angeles to Central America for a few months. As I watched them drive away in the PT Cruiser upgrade they had rented up north, I didn't know this would be the last time I would ever hold them, kiss their precious faces. Hours later, I received the phone call dreaded by every parent. My daughters had been involved in a terrible traffic collision that took both of their lives in a fiery crash with an 18-wheeler. My life will never be the same without my treasured daughters. Our family and our lives are forever altered. The promise of life my talented daughters held was snuffed out in a matter of seconds. Rachel was 24 years young, and Jacqueline had just turned 20. In the weeks following our tra tra tragedy, still ravaged with excruciating grief and shock, we discovered through friends and acquaintances that the rental car my girls had been driving was under a safety recall. And after minimal investigation, we learned that the repairs had never been made. The defect involved a power steering hose that when, when it rubbed against another component caused a high pressure leak that ignited when it came into contact with the catalytic inverter, causing an underhood fire and the loss of steering control. We were dumbfounded. Why didn't the rental car company fix this defect before renting out a vehicle that was a ticking time bomb? After the company had received the recall notice, the vehicle had been rent rented three other times before my daughters had rented it. Moreover, we were stunned to learn that there was no law and no regulation that prohibited this reckless business practice. After five years of litigation and a few days before trial, the rental car company finally admitted 100% liability in the deaths of my daughters. The lawsuit wasn't about money. It was about learning the truth, holding the company accountable, and making sure the public learned the truth, too. We didn't agree to a confidentiality agreement, and that is why I'm here today to tell you my story. We walked out of the courtroom knowing that this was likely happen again to someone else who rented a car under an open safety recall. We learned the company that rented the car to my kids never had a specific policy for dealing with recalled cars. The policy was to rent the car even if the car was under an open safety recall. During our campaign to bring this issue to the attention of lawmakers, we realized that the business of renting cars under so open safety recalls, either through a rental company or an auto dealer, is a huge consumer problem. When the media reported on this issue, most consumers were stunned that in fact rental cars with dangerous defects can be rented out with impunity. An online petition to pressure rental car companies into supporting this common sense legislation resulted in 150,000 signatures in 48 hours. We believed, as many consumers do, that rental car companies and auto dealers have a duty since they're in the business of renting and selling cars to ensure that the vehicles they are offering to the public are safe. Every provider of rental cars, whether from a big rental car company or a used car dealer, should be required to repair unreasonably dangerous defects before those cars are rented to the public. Recalled cars endanger the lives of everyone who shares the roads. Not only the people who are riding in them, but other drivers as well. While my daughters happen to collide with an 18-wheeler, resulting in minor injuries to the truck driver and his passenger. This could have easily been a minivan full of children with more lives lost. Nobody should have to worry about whether a car they rent is safe to drive. Nobody should have to endure the loss of a loved one because a rental car company didn't bother to get an unsafe recalled car repaired. This is simple to fix.
This is doable now. Please pass this law. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hawk. We now welcome David Strickland, the administrator, the administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, that we call. Madam Chairman, Mrs. Boxer, Senator Blumenthal, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to testify about this very important issue. Um, the Rachel and Jacqueline Howe Safe Criminal Car Act of 2013 is a very important piece of legislation that frankly addresses a safety gap that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has in order to make sure that we can enforce against rental car companies that do not fix their vehicles. I'd also like to thank Senator Schumer and Senator Boxer again reintroducing this fantastic bill. This really is our opportunity to address something that frankly is the wrong that needs to be made right. The tragedy surrounding the deaths of the two women for which this legislation is named cannot be overstated. Their mother, Kelly Houck, has worked tirelessly to ensure that this does not happen to another family. And I can also say, Senator Boxer, that she met with me and my staff as well, and I couldn't agree with you more. There isn't a, a greater American and more passionate mother than Kelly. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is tasked with ensuring the safety and the reliability of the United States vehicle fleet. We play a critical role in protecting drivers from the risks associated with auto safety recalls. The agency has one of the most effective defect investigation programs in the world. We receive and screen over 40,000 consumer complaints every single year, and we pursue investigations and recalls when warranted. We are continually working to provide drivers with the information that they need to stay safe behind the wheel. All NHTSA safety recalls address an unreasonable risk to safety and should not be ignored. Unfortunately, we do not have the statutory authority to protect rental car customers. Currently, there is no prohibition on rental car companies from renting vehicles that are under a recall, but have yet to be remedied. This is precisely why the legislation the Senate is considering is so critical. In November of 2010, NHTSA opened an inquiry to learn about rental car companies' recall completion rates and the policies concerning the rental of recalled vehicles. We sent formal information requests to various auto manufacturers seeking information on recall completion rates for several different recall campaigns. The information requested focused on recall campaigns and involved new vehicles that were likely to include large numbers of vehicles found in rental fleets. The information at the time indicated that major rental car companies did not have firm written policies requiring the vehicle to be grounded until repaired. Instead, the companies allowed the recalled vehicles to be rented under certain circumstances. While the inquiry is still ongoing, the information submitted by the manufacturers indicated that the recall completion rates of the major rental fleets was about 50% at 120 days after the start of the recall, and about 60% one full year after the recall was started. We want all drivers to be safe on the road, whether they're driving rental vehicles or their own personal cars. We believe that rental car companies should provide safe vehicles for consumers, and that con companies should be promptly remedy these recalled vehicles. We understand that major rental car companies are supportive of this legislation, and we appreciate their efforts to prevent tragedies like the one that occurred with the Halk family from ever happening again. At the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, we will continue to work to ensure the highest standards of safety on our nation's roadways. S-921 will close a gap in current law and give us one more tool in protecting the driving public. I am now ready to answer any questions the committee may have, and I also want to take one moment to uh, pray for the families in Oklahoma. I, once again, as a person who works on public health and safety every single day to see those types of tragedies, it, it really is just heartbreaking. So yeah, we all, I think we all share your prayers, um, Mr. Strickland. And it was uh, two years ago and two days that we had uh, a tragedy strike Joplin, and uh, this all brings it back and, and uh, vividly what um, a community in Missouri faced. and. I can only say to the people of Moore, Oklahoma, that uh, the outpouring of support will be significant and it will be inspiring. 
and um, it certainly wasn't Joplin, and uh, the tenacity of the Joplin community was a, a sight to behold, and I am sure that the good people in Moore, Oklahoma will have that same inner strength that will help them through this, along with a lot of faith. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to try to have a habit to, with some frequency, defer to my colleagues for questioning first in order to encourage participation in our subcommittee hearings. <laughs> so I will turn over uh, for the first set of questions to Senator Boxer. Thank you. As I said in my opening statement, this is a very straightforward and important reform. Frankly, it's shameful that this hasn't been fixed before. And I just want to ask you, um, Ms. Strickland, thank you so much for being here, and we're so happy to see you in this position. Um, thank you, Ms. Have Bob. you had a chance to look at the safety recall that was uh, sent out on this power steering hose uh, by Damler Chrysler to the owners of that, uh, of that vehicle? Yes, Senator Boxer, it's NHTSA policy. Basically, the way recalls work is that we will either screen and we'll see a particular issue or anomaly in a particular vehicle, and we will notify the manufacturer that we believe there's an unreasonable risk to safety. The manufacturer can then make a decision to voluntarily recall the vehicle, or they, if they disagree with the agency, uh, they can then go towards a more formal process. In this particular issue, this was an influence recall by NHTSA, but this was voluntarily done by Daimler Chrysler. So yes, we knew of this recall and we knew of the importance of getting this thing okay. fixed. Well, I ask unanimous consent to place in the record this actual recall notice. Is that all right? With that without, without, without objection. Thank you. Um, and, and let me just share with my friends, and I'm so glad, Senator Blumenthal, you're here uh, because you and the chairman are attorneys, and this is just so straightforward. This was sent out by Damla Chrysler. Dear name, this notice is sent to you to, in accordance with the requirements of the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act. Damla Chrysler Corporation has decided that a defect which relates to motor vehicle safety exists in some 2001 through 2004 model year Chrysler PT Cruiser and 05 model year blah blah describes who it's sent to. And they describe the problem. It's very straightforward. The problem is the power steering pressure uh, hose on your PT Cruiser may contact the transaxle differential cover. And it talks about how the hose could rub through and leak power steering fluid. And, and then it says, Power steering fluid leakage in the presence of an ignition source can result in an underhood fire. Right here. And the rental car company got this notice. It's my understanding. They got this notice. They did nothing. There was no law, and they did nothing. Now, this is the question I want to ask you. It's not complicated, but... If this is so important, important enough that Chrysler told anyone who owned one of these vehicles that they should, what should they do? It says right here, what you must do, contact your dealer right away to schedule an appointment and bring this letter. So if it was important enough to notify the owners and then to notify the rental company, isn't it? exactly as important to notify the people who are unknowingly marching into a defective vehicle. Not only is it more important, Mrs. Boxer, it's as out. important. It's as, as important and it should be fixed. We, I mean, if it poses on a reasonable risk of safety, the car rental company, frankly, has a moral obligation to get that car fixed as soon as it possibly can. We want everybody to get their cars fixed. Right. So, so if we're going to notify everybody else, and by law they have to, we need to fix this law just to make sure that this tragedy doesn't happen again. Now, is there anything you know, worse about a person who leases a car? No. We've got to protect all our people. Now, I understand one of the later panels, Madam Chairman, who's opposing us, is going to point out, well, there's a lot of recall notices, and I would ask you, Madam Chair, to place in the record another four of these that deal with lots of other issues. May I do Without that? Without objection. Okay. Very, very clear. Corolla, this, that, a whole series of these. And, and, and I understand one of those against us is going to say, well, it didn't say it was life-threatening. What? It didn't say do not drive. So if it doesn't say do not drive, 
the opponents say, big deal. It didn't say do not drive on this one, on Dan McChrysler. So you're a, if you come here with that argument, you are not making an argument that was going to hold up for one second. So don't even make it, and if you do, I'll be here. What to do? Go right in and get it fixed. Every one of these says that. Somebody said, oh, well, what if it's just a defogger or something like that? Big deal. And that's in here. One of them was a defogger. Do you ever try driving when a defogger doesn't work? It once happened to me. Can't see a damn thing. So don't tell me that a lot of these are so unimportant. They're all important. So, I mean, essentially, I want to thank you for your support for this legislation. And I urge the Obama administration to work with us because we got to get it through this committee, we got to get it through the Senate, then we got to get the House to do it, and we cannot stop until it is done. So we're going to need the President's help, the administration's help. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Boxer. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Senator McCaskill. I want to thank you for having this hearing on this critically important topic and using this subcommittee, which is so important. And thank you also to Senator Boxer and most especially Senator Schumer. I'm very proud to be joining them, as well as Senator McCaskill, in co-sponsoring this very, very important bill. And I just want to say a particular thanks to uh, to Ms. Hauk for being here today. I know how much courage and fortitude it takes, but your testimony puts a face and a voice to an issue that for many people is simply abstract and technical. And there's nothing technical or abstract about the, the dangers or the damage suffered every day in America as a result of the defects in automobiles that recalls can help to cure. Uh, in Connecticut, a Greenwich man named Gary Massey was permanently disabled in a 2008 crash that involved his car, a Lexus ES350 loaner, that had been recalled for an unsecure floor mat, but not repaired. He hit a tractor trailer on the highway while the car was careening out of control. Now, a floor mat doesn't involve what uh, a lot of people think would be a critical part of an automobile's system. The position of the national automobile dealers, uh, our friends in the association, is that only those recalls, and I'm quoting, which require immediate repairs to systems such as steering, fuel delivery, accelerator controls, or other crucial components, end quote, should be considered before renting a car. I respect their point of view, but my question for you, Mr. Strickland, is uh, do you think that rental companies or auto dealers should be deciding which recalls are crucial? Aren't they all crucial? Senator Blumenthal. There is one standard for safety that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration follows and enforces. We deal with unreasonable risk to safety. We don't gradate them. If there isn't a judgment that it is on a reasonable risk, it's on a reasonable risk and it needs to be repaired. And the, the notion that there should be some gradation of unreasonable risks is, is frankly counter to the policy for safety and, and frankly dangerous. Senator, I just have to say, you know, uh, the unsecured mats you know, uh, your constituent that was involved in a crash. The Sailor family in San Diego, four people died because of an unsecured mat. So you can't say that these risks are small or large. They can all possibly injure or kill some, and they have to be addressed equally. Anything that goes wrong while a driver is behind the wheel can involve a crash or some other kind of malfunction that can result in human injury or death. Is that not so? Absolutely right. Thank you very much, Mr. Strickland. Thank you for being here today, and I really appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Strickland, for being here. We appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And we will uh, continue to be in consultation with you as we move towards final passage of this legislation. And if the second panel will come up, that would be terrific.
Welcome. I will introduce the panel. Uh, we have Ms. Sharon Faulkner, Executive Director of American Car Rental Association. Ms. Rosemary Shahan, am I saying that correctly? Shahan? Shahan, President of Consumers for Auto Reliability and Safety. Mr. Mitch Bainwall, President and CEO, Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. And Mr. Peter Welch, the President of the National Automobile Dealers Association. And we will begin with the testimony of Ms. Faulkner. Good morning and thank you, Senator McCaskill and Senator Heller and Senator Blumenthal and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here in support of legislation of vital importance to the rental car and car sharing industry and to our customers. My name is Sharon Faulkner and I'm the Executive Director of the American Car Rental Association, or ACRA. ACRA represents more than 235 companies in the rental car and car sharing industry. Our members range from the brands you would recognize, such as Enterprise, Avis, Hertz. It also includes many mid-sized companies, as well as small and mom and pop operations. Our members run fleets as large as one million vehicles and as small as 10 vehicles. On a personal note, before becoming the executive director, I, along with my husband, operated one of those smaller rental car companies in upstate New York for more than 30 years. While I was a franchisee or licensee of one of the major brands, we were truly a smaller business operating about six locations and 300 vehicles. When my husband and I decided to sell our business several years ago and I was asked to assume my current role as executive director of our trade association, I jumped to that opportunity because I believe the car rental industry provides a very important service and this role allows me to continue to promote outstanding customer satisfaction. It is critically important to understand the makeup of ACRA and that our organization actively participated in the process that produced the legislation embodied in S921. Safety in our industry is paramount. It's about trust between our customers and our individual businesses. The minute our customers don't feel safe is the minute we lose customers and potentially our livelihoods. Therefore, our industry has always placed a high priority on providing cars that are properly maintained and safe for our customers to use. Over the last several years, with the sad and unfortunate loss of Rachel and Jacqueline Houck, the issue of recalls in rental cars has been raised. Senator Schumer and Boxer ultimately introduced legislation in 2011 attempting to address these safety concerns. We, as an industry, initially had serious reservations with the broad scope of the legislation, as well as the implementation of it. Additionally, we believed as an industry, we were already taking the appropriate steps to protect our customers by following the guidance from the auto manufacturers. Over time, many of our members adopted conservative policies of grounding most, if not all, vehicles with an open recall. As a result, we believe legislation was not necessary and opposed the original legislation. However, we ultimately concluded that our customers would expect us to support this type of legislation. And if we could achieve a workable solution, we would do just that. We then proactively engaged in a dialogue with the staffs of Senator Schumer, Boxer, McCaskill, and Blunt, along with other stakeholders, such as key members of our industry and consumer advocates, including Mrs. Howe. Over the course of several months last year, our industry worked diligently through the scope and the operational concerns we had with the initial bill. We wanted to ensure that the legislation would be something that ACRA could emphatically support. And S921 is such a bill. I am happy to highlight for you the key compromise components of the bill. An industry supported provision in the bill defines the time frame in which rental companies need to ground the vehicles after receiving the safety recall notice. There is a period of time the companies need in order to receive the notice and successfully ground the appropriate vehicles. The original bill had no defined time frame and many members were concerned how that may be interpreted. At our urging, the legislation now calls for the vehicles to be grounded within 24 hours of receiving a safety recall notice, and we do have 48 hours in the case of larger recalls. The only exemption to the do not rent requirement is when the manufacturer has issued a safety recall and has not developed the permanent repair, but offers a temporary fix or an interim remedy. That eliminates the safety risk. If the rental car company performs the interim remedy, and then the car may be continued to be rented. The best real life example of this 
is when there was a recall due to a faulty accelerator pedal. Our industry, along with other consumers at the direction of the manufacturer, pulled the floor mats out of the vehicles and continued to keep the cars in service. Thousands of private consumers did the same and the vehicles remained safely on the road. The bill now contains language that specifically permits an interim remedy when appropriate. Our industry also sells a large number of cars each year. The legislation requires rental car companies to permanently repair any safety recall prior to selling a vehicle, either through retail or wholesale markets. The only exception to this requirement at the behest of the industry is when a vehicle has been so severely damaged that it can only be sold for parts. <coughs> I would like to underscore here that this sales prohibition for rental car companies will be unique. We will be the only used car seller that will be required to perform any recall work prior to sale, either at retail or wholesale. In conclusion, we have come together with the sponsors, supporters, and staff in good faith negotiations. The consumer advocates listened and were pragmatic about many of our early objections, and I firmly believe that our industry did likewise. This is the way the process is supposed to work, and we're thankful to be a part of it. We are often asked why, as an industry, we are willing to accept new regulations upon ourselves. The response to that is easy. We engaged and became part of the process. The end result is a proposal that will provide our customers additional assurance that the vehicles they rent are safe and provides our industry with a uniform federal standard across the country and that addresses our original operational concerns. I encourage those who oppose S921 to engage toward that same important goal that we have. I respectfully ask you to support S921. I look forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Madam Chair, um, Senator Boxer, Senator Blumenthal, Senator Blunt, um, thank you very much for the invitation to testify for the Rachel and Jacqueline Safe Rental Car Act of 2013. I'm Rosemary Shahan. I'm president of Consumers for Auto Reliability and Safety. We're based in Sacramento, California, and we're probably best known for initiating California's auto lemon law that helped inspire the lemon law that Senator Blumenthal um, worked so diligently to pass in Connecticut and um, was enacted in all 50 states. And um, I would especially like to thank Senator Schumer, Senator Boxer, and you, Senator McCaskill, and your staffs for your excellent um, and inspiring leadership and hard work, and Senator Blumenthal, Senators Murkowski, Feinstein, Gillibrand, Casey, and Schatz for co-sponsoring this vitally important auto safety legislation. When um, I first heard from Callie Hauk about what had happened, I, you know, I've been working on auto safety issues since 79, and I had no idea. Um, that rental car companies were exempt from our safety recall system. Um, to me, it just seemed like a no-brainer. And since then, we've done polling on this issue. In the, in the great state of Missouri, we um, polled um, and found that the public at 86 percent um, supported requiring rental car companies to ground vehicles when they're under safety recall and get them fixed. In fact, the most common reaction that we get from people is, you mean this isn't the law already? And the other reaction we get is, you mean they have to be told? And clearly the answer to the first one is, um, no, it's not the law already, and yes, they do have to be told. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today with the rental car industry. We worked very diligently with them, um, with your leadership and help, and reached a workable compromise that improves safety for consumers and takes into account their business model. It's a very balanced compromise. And really, the question before you, as Senator Roxer has mentioned, is whether Congress should allow rental car companies to rent vehicles to the public that are so unsafe that's a violation of federal law to sell them as new cars. And whether the decision to risk the public safety should depend on the type of the transaction and not on how unsafe the vehicle is. And to consumers, it really doesn't make any sense to decide whether you're exposed to the risk, whether you buy this as a new car from a car dealer 
or we either rent it from a rental car company. People expect that when they rent a vehicle, whether it's from a rental car company like um, Enterprise, Hertz, or Avis, or whether it's from a car dealer, they expect it to be safe. They just feel like this, this is something that is so basic. Um, once a safety recall is issued, it's a violation of federal law for a new car dealer to sell it as a new car, but it's still legal to rent the same car to a family that's going to get into it and take it to Disneyland. And that's what we really hope that you will help us change. This vehicle applies only to vehicles that are being recalled by the manufacturer by, under a federal motor vehicle safety recall. It does not require rental car companies to ground vehicles for things like service campaigns or less risky types of, of problems or for recalls of the emission system. It applies only to vehicles where the rental car company is a registered owner and receives the notice that Senator Boxer showed, the very specifically mandated and worded notice. It requires them to ground them as soon as practicable or within 24 hours for smaller recalls or 48 hours for the largest recalls um, involving 5,000 vehicles or more in a particular company's fleet. It allows them to continue to rent vehicles pending an ultimate repair when the manufacturer's notice provides for an interim measure that eliminates the safety risk. So we believe it has the flexibility for the industry at the same time it protects consumers. It doesn't do everything we want it to accomplish, but we really need this law. And we agreed with the rental car companies to join together in support of this legislation in order to create a uniform federal standard rather than pursuing legislation state by state. California Senator Bill Monning, who represents a district where Rachel and Jackie were killed, has agreed to forestall enactment of legislation he authored in 2011 in order to allow Congress time to address the problem nationally where it really should be addressed. We hope and pray that you will vote to enact this act, named for Rachel and Jackie. It's beyond your power to bring them back to life, but the fate of others who rent vehicles to visit their parents, take a vacation or go on a business trip, or share the roads with them, rests in your hands. Thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bainwell. Uh, Chairman McCaskill, Senator Boxer, Senator Blunt, uh, thank you for the opportunity today to testify. My name is Mitch Bainwall. I am president of the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. Our 12 members produce and or sell about three or four cars in this country. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to make a comment as a dad. Uh, I have three kids, ages 15 to 21, uh, two drive. The third is about to learn to drive, which uh, is a tough process for any father. Uh, every time they go on a trip, I wait for that text or that call to, that says they've made it to their destination, and I can't imagine what it would be like not to get that call. So uh, I, I get the, the impetus behind this hearing in a very personal, real way. Uh, and I'm moved by the work that Mrs. Hawk has done to address the tragedy that occurred in 2004. She's made a difference. Rental car policies are forever changed. Her experience and her commitment moved the rental car industry with the big four voluntary agreement in many ways for practical purposes this is a settled question mm -hmm. so we're now focused on two questions one how to lock in the commitment that she received and two whether the proposed statutory response generates side effects that warrant modification as we move through the legislative process in the, in the senate I would like to say nothing more than that we expect smooth sailing as we move forward, but we do have some concerns that we hope can be addressed. We are not part of the crafting process. Uh, our input was not part of that exercise, and this is our first opportunity to really engage. So let's step back and look at the fact situation. First, the awful crash that killed the Hawk sisters in 2004 caused the rental car industry to revise its practices regarding the repair of recalled vehicles. The safety benefits are evident that there have not been any other fatalities in the almost nine years that have transpired. We're not complacent about this at all, yet we are very, very thankful 
especially given the huge magnitude of, of activity that characterizes the U.S. rental market. Second, the rental car companies representing 94 percent of the market have pledged to maintain that policy. So the scope of the issue is really how to protect the insurance policy and then how you deal with the 6 percent of the market that hasn't made the same commitment. So we view this as important progress. And we turn now to the effect of this bill from a public policy perspective. Uh, I understand that things can be simple, but I think we have to unpack it a bit to understand the implications of federalizing the voluntary action. Uh, we're most fearful that it creates a dual track system, a new system for rental car companies that would ground every vehicle, period, essentially overriding manufacturer guidance and overriding the guidance of NHTSA as reflected in, uh, in that process. And two, the current but now separate system for moms, dads, and other vehicle owners who also want their vehicles repaired in a timely fashion. The dual track system would have significant real world consequences that we should all find concerning because they would create future problems that we can avoid. Those two problems are these. One, it would place families at a disadvantage relative to rental car companies because the bill creates enormous economic pressure to move those companies in the front of the line for the repairs ahead of the rest of your constituents. And two, it would increase costs for all rental car customers, families and business folks, because the legislation introduces loss of use liability that would ultimately be passed on to consumers. Given that the safety benefits have already been realized for 94 percent of the market, it is fair to evaluate whether introducing these adverse consequences is prudent. Our conclusion is that the bill needs some work, and we're, pledge, we're pledging to work with you to, to get to a fix that meets the objective that you're looking for without introducing these adverse consequences. One option the committee should look at carefully would be to convert the legislation into a meaningful, precise, and prescriptive notification program that would both eliminate the dual track challenge as well as address the liability concern. And Senator Boxer, you introduced your first question to Administrator Strickland on the question of notification. We agree with you absolutely. When a customer goes to the rental car uh, counter to get a car, they should be notified. That's exactly the right approach. We're open to other approaches. So we're not prescriptive in terms of how to deal with it, but we do think that we need to continue uh, to uh, try to craft something that, in fact, meets the very noble objective that you've laid out. Uh, we agree with the objective, we agree with the intent, and we want to make sure that we solve this problem without introducing adverse consequences. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bainwell. Mr. Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senators, my name is Peter Welch. I'm the relatively new president of the National Automobile Dealers Association. NADA represents over 16,000 franchise new car and truck dealer members, 40% uh, of which uh, sell fewer than uh, 200 new cars a year or in virtually every community in the country. As you know, dealers play a vital role in ensuring that recalled vehicles are fixed and made safe. For millions of consumers, it's the dealer alone who remedies a recalled vehicle. When owners receive a recall notice but fail to act, many dealers will contact their customers to schedule an appointment. When a customer brings her car in for routine service, it's the dealer who performs the recall or warranty work outstanding and at no charge to the consumer. During the 2010 Toyota unintended acceleration recall, many Toyota dealerships stayed open 24 hours a day to meet demand. The recall system Congress created is dependent on new car dealers to faithfully fix the millions of vehicles that are recalled annually. We support the purpose behind S921. Vehicles that are unsafe to operate should not be rented. Not only is it irresponsible, but the legal liability that a dealership would face for doing so uh, would probably bankrupt most of them. We do have a few concerns, uh, and as the other uh, witnesses indicated, we'd like to work uh, with the committee and the authors and the co-authors uh, to make it even a better bill and to hopefully address some of our concerns. Our concerns are not many, uh, but uh, notwithstanding some of the testimony we heard uh, this morning, um, not all recalls are the same. Some recalls, uh, it's been our experience, don't render a vehicle uh, unsafe to drive in the near term. But uh, S921 in its current form really doesn't distinguish between recalls that uh, pose an immediate danger 
and those of a more technical nature or those that uh, could manifest themselves uh, over a long period of time. Uh, but regardless of that, all of the vehicles would have to be grounded. Uh, we gave a couple examples in my submitted testimony. Uh, I won't elaborate, but uh, we have others uh, some where uh, there's a misprint, for instance, uh, in an owner's manual. It, it violates uh, the Motor Vehicle Standards Act. Uh, we have another example that we submitted on a, 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 a visor sticker that had a propensity to separate. Um, a dealer may not have that uh, replacement visor in stock, yet that would have to be grounded as well. Um, we also believe that it's somewhat overly broad uh, in that it globs in the same category these multinational rental car companies that have thousands of vehicles of all makes and models uh, with res in the same pool with uh, franchise new car dealers, many of which have very small loaner fleets, uh, nine or ten, uh, but anybody that has five uh, would be covered under the bill. Uh, recall work can sometimes be delayed through no fault of the dealer because parts aren't available or have not yet been uh, designed, tested, manufactured, or distributed. Um, the standard uh, where an auto manufacturer can do a so-called temporary fix that would eliminate a safety risk, uh, it's been our experience that uh, eliminating a safety risk, I mean elimination, is a very high bar, and we doubt that uh, any manufacturers would issue uh, to us. Uh, Senator Boxer mentioned earlier uh, that some manufacturers do um, issue stop-drive notices. Uh, about 10% of them are there. Uh, there are a larger category of vehicles that would be unsafe to drive, and we would not advocate for all of the reasons stated above that those vehicles be rented or operated. Uh, finally, the bill would subject dealers to new inspections, new reporting requirements, new penalties, and give NHTSA the authority to add more regulatory burdens uh, as it deemed appropriate. Uh, in tax law, health care, and other areas, Congress has recognized the difference between big businesses and small businesses. We believe there's a vast difference between a multinational corporation with fleets of hundreds of thousands of rental cars and auto dealers with a fleet of five vehicles. Uh, we pledge to work with the subcommittee to ensure the dealers are not disproportionately impacted by the well-intentioned legislation, and we thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Um, I, I think I want to start out by just making a, a, a statement that uh, all car rental companies sell cars, and the vast majority of car dealerships rent cars. So we're talking about two different commercial enterprises where the emphasis may be on one or the other, but they're both engaging in the same category. So let me start with you, Mr. Bainwall. You say that you're worried about a dual track. Um, don't you have, wouldn't that same worry I guess, exist right now? I mean, if they're voluntarily grounding all their call, cars right now, and they are, without a doubt, if you take the big four together, um, they, they're not as good a customer as your dealers, the, but they are a very big customer right now, so I don't understand why making it mandatory creates any more of a dual track than making it voluntary. The, the biggest reason, and I'm not a lawyer, but the biggest reason is that by making it mandatory, you've introduced loss of use liability. And once you introduce loss of use liability, you then change the cost equation, and you make it, you set up the incentive structure such that the pressure will be to solve the enterprise problem and not your constituents' problem. Well, what about the dealers? Bart, it'll be your turn in a minute. <laughs> I'm trying to hold her down here, honestly. She's about to come out of her chair. Um, I, I, I'm trying to figure out, though, don't you have to do that now for your dealers, for them to be able to sell these cars? I mean, don't they have a loss of use in terms of being able to move their product off their, so the, the, and, and they're all, believe me, they're paying that floor plan. I, I don't I, think you're taking I, over the floor plan I, while you're, they're waiting for the recall vehicles to be fixed before sale, are you? Uh, we, want, we definitely want to keep this question as simple as we possibly can, but we have to also make sure we unpack this to the point that we understand what we're talking but about. But you understand and the point I'm making. I think I do, but let me, let me just make this point. Uh, you cannot sell a car where there's a recall, right? So what happens is when a recall is issued, the customer receives, the owner of the car receives the notification. In the case of the rental car companies, they are the owner, so they're receiving that notification. The problem that we have today 
is that the customer who goes to the rental car counter is not getting that notification like the moms and dads are who have bought the car when they that. buy it themselves. I get that. Um, uh, Mr. Welch, um, don't you guys make money on the back end when there's a recall? Uh, we are reimbursed by the auto manufacturers. And isn't it profitable? I mean, I remember once upon a time, I was very involved in a car dealership, and I remember even in the darkest hours, the back end was reliable, and um, recalls were not a bad thing. Uh, they were a bad thing in terms of the disruption of the business, but they're, they're profitable, aren't they? Aren't recall repairs profitable for you? Yes, they are. Senator. Okay. The so if they're profitable for you, and are most of the rental cars that you guys do, I assume they're part of your floor plan and you're just you're moving them through and then you move them back out for sale? Uh, that's not correct, Senator. Okay. Uh, vehicles that are in our inventory would be untitled vehicles. Uh, they would be new vehicles. Uh, vehicles that would be in a loaner fleet or that would be in a rental fleet uh, of a dealer would be licensed and registered. Uh, um, our insurance carriers wouldn't allow us to just pluck vehicles out of our inventory and put them in a rental. Well, but after you license them and you loan them or, um, or you rent them, I assume you're, you're going to sell them. Uh, we would eventually sell them either. And you would sell them on the used wholesale. lot as opposed to wholesale, correct? Uh, we may take them to the auction or wholesale them. Um, it would all depend on circumstances. Well, um, 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 I, I would just say that I think there certainly um, is an impetus if you know the history of the car and you know and you can control how many miles you put on it, 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 it certainly would be decent used car inventory as opposed to some of the other cars that you would typically wholesale. And so I guess one of my question is, if you know you've got to fix it before you can either wholesale it or put it on the used lot, why would you mind fixing it as quickly as possible as opposed to waiting until after it, you move it out of your rental or loaner fleet into the used lot or off to the auction? Uh, Senator, uh, you're absolutely correct when you stated earlier that we have an incentive to do it. As soon as the parts are available, we immediately fix the car. The, the bottleneck uh, occurs quite frankly because of back order on parts and for right. no really no other reason well I, I you know the interesting thing is we're dealing with two big folks here for the automobile manufacturers uh, the rental car companies are a big customer but nobody's bigger than your dealers and so the irony is we got these big folks up here trying to figure out how to get this done and all we're trying to do is make sure the little folks down here um, are not somehow caught up in how you prioritize what gets fixed when. But I know this, uh, the dealers are incentivized to fix, and I have um, a hard time imagining that most dealers aren't going to move those recall notices cars that are in their rental uh, or loaner fleet immediately into the back and, and get that cash flow going on that recall as quickly as possible. I will uh, uh, turn it over to... Senator Blunt now for questions. Senator uh, Bosch wants to go ahead. Oh, you really? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Blunt, you've always been my friend. Well, I am out of my seat, Mr. Bainwall, with some of the things you say. Honestly, I don't know what planet you're living on. You're trying to say that, oh, if these, if these rental car companies uh, get first dibs at the fix, it's going to hurt my constituents? Who do you think's renting these cars? Our constituents, it's all about the people. Senator, so don't, no, no. wait a minute, I will ask you my question. When I ask you my question, I have to get this off my chest. We're trying to protect, Senator McCaskill, the little people. We're trying to protect our constituents, whether they own a car, whether they lease a car, whether they rent a car for a weekend, like Callie's daughters did, or your kids might. And, you know, you said it really well when you opened up as a dad. I wait for that text of that call, that they made it to their destination, quote, unquote. Now, it's bad enough when we teach our kids to drive. In my case, my grandson's now learning. I have post-traumatic stress thinking back. Even if they step into a perfectly safe car. But if I know they could be in a recall car, my stress will go exponentially up. And, I, and, it, and I'll tell you something. After this happened to Callie, the first call I made was to my 
family, and then to my staff. And you know what I said? I said, only go to Hertz. Because they were the only ones that stepped up to the plate immediately and said, we'll do this voluntarily. And then happily, the others came along. Thank you, all of you. And I'm going to keep looking at that you know, every day until we pass this law. But to also sit here and say, it's a settled question. The companies are doing it on their own. <clears throat> I know you're not a lawyer. I'm not either. But I got to tell you, it ain't a settled question until there's a law. You've got people of goodwill now. What happens in 5, 10, 15 years? So don't tell me it's a settled question when you're treating people differently. Her children, Callie's children, were not treated the same as somebody who went in to buy a new car. So let's be clear. I want to ask each of you to respond, yay or nay, yes or no, to this question. And we'll start with Ms. Falkland. We'll go right down. Do you believe a rental car company should be allowed to rent out or sell a vehicle that is under a safety recall, understanding that we do have interim fixes. Do you believe a rental car company should be allowed to rent out or sell a vehicle that is under a safety recall? Nay. No. It's not a fair question, ma'am. It certainly is. Yes or no? The, 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 the answer is that in today's world, most of the marketplace does not do it. So it's an academic question, not a practical question. Do you think, do you think, sir, I didn't ask you whether they do it or they don't. I asked you if they should. Do you believe a rental car company should be allowed to rent out or sell a vehicle that is under a safety recall? It, it yes does, or no? It, it, well, you don't answer. Mr. Welch. If the vehicle's unsafe, it shouldn't Thank be. Thank you. Um, let me say, there are other things that you're saying here. And Mr. Welch, I want to talk to you about this. You said that the problem is there's not enough parts. Now, and Mr. Bainwall said, oh, we've got to deal with the people who own the cars first, and then we can't, we don't, we can't. Here's the deal. Suppose there was no rental car business at all, and we had a certain number of cars that had to be fixed because there was no rental car business. Are you saying that there ought to be some type of priority? If we had no rental car business, but we have the same number of cars sold, are you saying you couldn't handle it, sir? In terms of the parts, Mr. Bainwall, I'm asking you. I, I'm not a parts administrator. I'm, what I'm saying is that the bill, as you've, as you've drafted it, introduces a bias to put enterprise ahead of, ahead of a regular customer, ahead of a regular uh, mom and dad. Show me in the bill where we do that. You do that by You're making it up. No, I'm not. Show me the page. Senator, first of all, let's... Show it to me. Senator, let's back up for a second. Show okay. me the page. Senator, can we back up for a second? May I have a chance to respond? I'm asking you, you said our bill gives priority okay. you, to, to fix this to go to the rental car company first. Show me where we do that in the bill, sir. Once you federalize a voluntary agreement, you've introduced absolutely a loss of use liability. That, by definition produces an economic incentive to treat enterprise over other customers. I don't agree with you. Now, let me say this. You talk about this voluntary agreement. Do you know why the, how this agreement came about, sir? I know you invested much time and effort into it. That's not the point. I wrote a pledge. We took it out to the companies. Hertz was right there, and the others signed the pledge. So don't say this was something that they came together and did. But they it did it because they were challenged. But they support this law. Good for them. Senator, may, may I add one well, point? Well, just a minute. I want to ask you another question. This is my last question. If you, as a manufacturer, don't have enough parts to repair your defective vehicles, you better figure that out. One, don't make a defective product in the first place. That's the best idea. Second, announce the recall sooner so fewer defective cars are sold. And third, make more parts. You created the problem if the car is broken and you should fix it. So I'm not sympathetic to this point. We don't have enough parts because if we had no rental car industry and everyone owned their uh, cars, you'd have to fix everybody's cars. You wouldn't make these false distinctions. 
These are all our constituents. All we're trying to do is protect them. And I have to say, I am greatly disappointed. I hope when you offer to help us fix our legislation, you mean it. I do. Senator, uh, there's no question that we have a shared commitment to deal with the problem, okay? Uh, and and we, we say that uh, with absolute commitment, okay? 94% of the problem has been solved by the voluntary action. The question is how you deal with the 6% and how you deal with the problem in a fashion that doesn't introduce adverse consequences. Yeah. Understand that voluntary is voluntary and they could change their minds tomorrow, Mr. Bainwall. So I get that you're saying right now, um, you know, let 6% go. Um, and oh, I'm not saying that at all, Senator. I'm okay. saying let's deal with it in a different fashion. The core problem here is that you have a breakdown in notification. Okay. So what my suggestion is you take the voluntary action, you go ahead and you, you move a bill that requires notification so that no consumer ever again rents a car without, without being fully notified about the recall status, and then you move forward. Senator Blunt. I'm assuming, Mr. Bainwall, your point is that all recalls are not equal. That is part of the point. My broader point is that the marketplace has solved this problem, and when you federalize a voluntary agreement, you introduce adverse consequences that are anti-consumer. But you're saying if you told somebody that was renting a car that it was under recall, there might be reasons they would still want to rent that car? The, the, correct. If, if there's a loose, uh, 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 as uh, Mr. Welch said, if there's a loose uh, slip of paper on the visor, then a, a rational human being might say, I'll accept the car, I want yeah, the car. Yeah, you wouldn't have a okay. recall on that, though, would you? A loose well, slip think. of paper on the visor? Mm -hmm. no, that was the, the subject of one recall, Senator, yes. Or if the defroster doesn't work in Florida in August, you might make the choice that that's okay. So you're saying that all recalls would not be the same, which is what I ask. Uh, that's correct. Now, Ms. Faulkner, did you, uh, maybe I'm, I'm a little, I thought in your testimony you said there was something in this bill that allowed for accommodation mm -hmm. of some recalls, and you mentioned the, the floor mat uh, accelerator problem earlier. Would you tell me a little more about Am I wrong on that? Is there something here that lets you uh, uh, accommodate some recalls by an adjustment on site, or what did you mean by that? You said that the floor mats were taken out, and that's exactly what should have been. I believe that's what you said, that that was yes. exactly what should have been done. That is what I said, but that was a directive from the manufacturer to all consumers, including the car rental industry. And they said that was a safety fix. That is the only time that we would be allowed to make a decision on a recall is if the manufacturer tells us, here's your interim fix, the car is now safe, and you can rent it or you can drive it as a consumer. Otherwise, we get it repaired. We were just showing you an example of what a possible interim remedy could be. And does the law, as it's drafted now, allow for that inter interim remedy? It allows for that interim remedy if the manufacturer gives us the guidelines to do so. Yeah, not to be argumentative here, but do you, do you read this the same way as a representative of the manufacturer? Mr. I, I'm, uh, Senator Blunt, I apologize. I was lost in thought about something entirely different. Well, it was the idea that if you, if, if the, the, this bill would allow you, if there was an interim remedy, like right. taking the no, format out to tell yeah, everybody no. and they would do that and that was an interim. We believe that the, the notion of an interim fix here is a uh, – doesn't really work in the real world. Uh, the idea that you would eliminate the risk, as, as Mr. Welch said, is a bar that I don't think a manufacturer would, would be able to meet. But in the case of the – this wasn't – the, the floor mat, but did that actually do – No, no, I'm, I'm speaking more conceptually in terms of the, the exemption in the bill that allows uh, – a product that where the risk is eliminated, and that that uh, is a is a bar that is makes exemption from a practical purpose uh, meaningless. So, since it eliminates, the, that would be the problem you would have. You'd have to say this eliminates the risk. Mr. Welch, on the 
the do you think loaner cars and rental cars from a dealership should be treated differently in this area of recall and disclosure and uh, well I think there's a two or three different standards first of all the vehicles unsafe uh, if a compromise to a critical component of the vehicle it shouldn't be uh, rendered in any circumstance period uh, if it falls into that category uh, where uh, you know the rubber on the tire may separate after 50,000 miles and there's only 10,000 miles on the vehicle uh, or by the way it, there's a condition on the vehicle that isn't even subject to a recall. For instance, it has cracked windshields or worn out brakes or something. Those vehicles just should not be on the road, period. Uh, our problem uh, is one of proportionality. Uh, many of our small dealers will only have a single model uh, in their entire loaner fleet. And if that vehicle happens to be subject to one of these, uh, what I would call technical recalls, our entire fleet, unlike a Hertz or Avis that has thousands of vehicles of all line makes, it may be an economic hardship for them, but we're just plain out of luck uh, for the average dealer that has nine or ten loaner vehicles that are put out there on the road. But you wouldn't loan that vehicle out if you thought it was unsafe. The, the, the tort liability for negligent senator is so huge uh, that uh, we would be sued and lose. And you don't think in the case of if you also had a rental car, you wouldn't treat it differently than you'd treat that loan no, car? No differently whatsoever. Now you said in response to Senator Bosch's <coughs> question that everybody uh, was asked that you wouldn't be for uh, unsafe vehicles being rented. I think that's the you, you actually changed the question, I thought, a little bit. I assume, Mr. Bainwall, you're not for unsafe vehicles being rented either. That, that's correct. <coughs> um, you know, most everything I could thought of to ask, I thought that Senator Boxer and Senator McCaskill ask, and I benefited from the answer, so I'm going to yield back my, uh, well, I'm, actually, I'm over my time. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blunt. Um, just briefly, I, I I don't have a lot of follow-up questions. I think I understand where everyone is, and I get it. I get, believe me, I understand the car dealers not welcoming uh, more federal government to the dealership. I, I understand that in terms of an overall thematic problem, although I do uh, have a sense that while on a much smaller scale, there is still a high probability that somebody could get a rental car from a dealership that um, had a problem that hadn't been fixed and I certainly know you have incentives profit wise to get those things fixed as quickly as possible it seems to me that a lot of this is fear about being sued Mr. Bainwall um, that the manufacturers are worried that you're opening up a new line of vulnerability in terms of your liability for loss of use in terms of the profits of the rental car company uh, their loss of profits during the time period in which the recalls are uh, being performed and the repairs are being done. Um, I'm just curious, has, does that same fear exist about loss of profits and costs associated with your dealers when they have a number of vehicles that they have to take off the floor uh, that they have to continue pay interest on their floor plan. Have you, have the manufacturers ever been sued by the dealers for loss of profits due to a recall? Uh, Peter may know the answer to that. Uh, Senator, actually there is a provision in the law that if a new franchise, new car dealer has a grounded fleet, uh, that the, the provisions do allow us to collect monetary damages as up to, up to 1% of the MSRP per month. So we are compensated in circumstances, as were our Toyota dealers uh, recently. So it, my colleague just asked what MSRP is. Most Manufacturers of suggested retail Most price. of us don't Excuse know that because most of us don't pay that, right? <laughs> 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 I don't know very many consumers that are paying MSRP. If they are, they need to see me because I can help them. Um, so, um, so you all collect 1%. Yeah, the regulations and the law does allow us uh, in, in those limited circumstances. So it looks like we have a solution, Mr. Bainwall. How about 1%? Well, remember, we go back to the, the core proposition at the very beginning, which is that's a case of a dealer selling a car. What we're talking about here is where a purchase has already been made 
and it's what to do about a recall post-purchase. So it's a, it's a different animal, but your broader point about, about the concern about loss of use is completely valid, and it does get introduced by virtue of a, an approach that is a mandate rather than a notification But you get program. the point I'm making. Oh, I you do. would have had I the do. same fear of your dealers, except we put 1% in the law. So I, I, I didn't but, but, but suggest that when we met that 1% might solve the problem. No, 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 no. The, what, what we're, our, the concern here is that you, you, you're, this changes the incentive structure and the relationship and in the economics between the rental car, cust uh, rental car companies and the manufacturers. So, so, for instance, if you're in slow season and there are, uh, uh, the, vac the, the utilization rate is very low and a car is recalled, all of a sudden it becomes a revenue source because of the recall, because a car that's otherwise not rented is generating revenue. That's the concern in loss of use liability. So my, I guess I would, I would raise the question here, if loss of use liability is, is not something that the rental car companies want to pursue, perhaps Ms. Faulkner could, could clarify that. Well, and, and I think that's something you all can talk among yourselves about. Because if it's a slow season and they're going to try to make a loss of use case against you, first of all, you know, this is a, this is a sophisticated buyer-seller relationship. This isn't Joe Average coming in to buy a car. This is, you know, Enterprise and Hertz buying hundreds and thousands of cars from you guys every single year. So there, there I was... guess my, let me finish. Let me, I guess my point is that if, if you were going to try, and let's just say that it's the slow season and budget decides, hey, we got a recall out here, let's ship all those cars in for repair and then let's sue them for not being able to rent the cars for loss of use and it's the slow season and you, you're saying you're afraid of that revenue stream, well, can't we just put in the law that you have to show actual loss of use but profits, not not augment your slow season by turning in recalled cars and then sue them for it? And first of all, I can't imagine they'd be motivated to sue because they're biting the hands that feed them. You're going to turn around and charge them a lot more per vehicle the next year, which really impacts their bottom line. There's a more basic point here, and the basic point is simple. That is, in the voluntary action, there is no loss of use. Once you convert it, you introduce that risk. Why introduce that risk? Why, why throw in to a system that has a workable solution an economic problem that has all sorts of adverse consequences? Why not just simply carve it out? Well, I think what you've got, uh, Mr. Bainwall, and you may think that you can kill this legislation this year, um, but I think you're on the losing side potentially of a very bad public relations situation if you're not careful. And secondly, I think this is something we can work out. And I think this is something particularly that you ought to work out with your really good customers, the rental car companies, um, because nobody buys uh, more. And I bet you make more money off the cars you sell to rental companies than the ones that, that uh, the price you make the dealers pay you for them. You know, we've, we've established a, a relationship here as though we don't want to see a bill move forward. We do. We want to see a bill move forward that is productive, meets the goals, but doesn't introduce adverse consequences. Okay, well, let's uh, work out that loss of use thing. Let's make sure that it's actual loss of use so nobody can use the slow season to milk you guys. Well, why not just carve it out? Well, I, I, I think that when you start carving out whole causes of action from the federal level, uh, it gets to be a pretty dicey proposition. So I think that we've got to be careful about that. I'm open to talking about anything. I just don't want us to leave here under the assumption this bill's going to move with the plan that maybe it's really not going to move with some help from you guys um, maybe down the hall. So I want to make sure we try to get this worked out now rather than um, ending up six, nine months from now with Ms. Hauk going, what happened? We got all the rental companies to agree and everyone agreed and the only people that were, out, that were outside of the circle, so to speak, were the people who are making the cars that I think provide a pretty good, solid, safe vehicle, especially the, the strides you all have made in terms of safety, is remarkable in this country. And I'm very proud of it. And I'm very proud of the automobile manufacturing industry. So this should not be an adversarial situation. I remain hopeful that we can get it worked out. And thank you. Can I follow up, please? May I follow up? Sure. I want to pick up on this whole question. It sounds to me like you want to write our bill. And 
it's fine that you'll be at the table. I love to hear from you. But I want to pick up on, you've got to be very careful because you don't, you might get something that has bad ramifications for you, and I want to see what you think about this argument. You suggest the bill should include language prohibiting rental car companies from seeking loss of use damages from a manufacturer for having to ground rental cars for a long time. My, my philosophy on this one is you shouldn't take that long to figure out how to, how to work this out and fix it. And if you act in a reasonable time, I don't think you should be sued. But set it aside. Let's say for argument's sake we were to put that in. Look what this opens up. Should Congress also prohibit manufacturers from suing their parts suppliers for making faulty parts that trigger expensive recalls? You think we ought to get into that? You know, I'm, I'm, we don't want to write this bill. Well, under, I just asked you a question. No, but, but, but Can me, you answer me, the but question? But you raised a series of questions. Let me, no, let no, me. it's not a series. I asked one question. Please answer my question, sir. Please restate it. Should Congress prohibit manufacturers from suing their parts suppliers for making faulty parts that trigger expensive recalls? I, I think that's an entirely different question. I, should we do it? I don't, I, I think that, Of course no. not. Of, of course, course not. not. That is a different question. No, wait a minute. Once we wade into this question, and my chairman is an attorney, once you wade into this question of who can sue for what and how and when and where, watch out, because that's a whole other issue. In 2009, General Motors sued a supplier saying it spent more than 30 million fixing problems in the steering system of Chevrolet its best cobalt, its best-selling car. From 2008, Chrysler LLC is proceeding with its suit against Canadian auto parts maker Magna International to recoup money it spent on a recall involving defective heated seats in minivans. The point is, of course we shouldn't do that. And we shouldn't also wade into this issue. If you, if you don't fix recall cars in a timely fashion, it's a problem. As I said before, it's part of your business. You have to take care of business. You have to take care of fixing these cars. So I ask unanimous consent to place in the record an article, GM sues over millions spent on steering repairs. If I might put that in the record, Madam Chair. Absolutely. May, okay. I, may I make one comment, Senator? Yeah. Uh, we agree with you. We want to see these vehicles fixed as quickly as possible. There's, there's not a debate about the safety desire here. Nobody wants to see an event like what transpired in 2004 transpire. We're with you on that. Well, that's yeah, but, good. but the, the challenge here, and we don't want to write the bill, but we, but we want to contribute to fine. the crafting Let's of the bill, which we were not. Well, that's fine. That's fine. We will look and see whether what you recommend is in the public interest. But some of the things you said today are disturbing. And maybe you'll rethink them. You hinted that you definitely feel a young person comes to the counter one of the rental car companies and said, I want to rent a car. That they say there's one car left on the lot and you seem to indicate you would support the rental people having to say, but we want you to know there has been a recall notice about this car. There's a faulty floor mat or there's a faulty windshield wiper or the defogger system is out. And by the way, with the weather the way it is, don't say if a system goes out in Florida in August, it's a good thing. I don't know if you've ever experienced getting stuck without a defogger in a car. You might as well not, you can't see anything. So let's be clear. And then we heard about these floor mats. Now I think we've, so in my opinion, if it's my 18 year old or 21 year old who's going to the counter, they're ready to go on a vacation and they're told, oh, there's this little thing over here in the steering that, you know, it's not going to rain this weekend. The windshield wiper is broken, has to be recalled. I don't want to give that decision to my grandson or your kid or my chairman's, one of her daughters. And I don't think that should be on their shoulders to make a decision. We're the grown-ups in the room. Fix it if it's broken. Don't fight us. And I would say, in closing, I'd like to hear from Ms. Shahan because she's worked so hard. You've heard a lot of things here today. And, and I would like you to state, because you, you speak from the heart and also from facts. 
is our bill a danger to anybody? Is it going to do something bad, or is it going to protect our constituents? Um, Senator, it will save lives and prevent injuries. There's no question about it. And to me, it's disturbing to hear the auto manufacturers propose notification in lieu of fixing the car. Um, fixing the car. I'm saying fix the car as expeditiously as you possibly can. Please do not put words in my mouth. Fix the car, achieve the safety objective that we all share, and give notification just as we do to every other consumer that buys a car. They get notification of the recall. The gap is in the process right now is that when you, when you rent a car, there is no notification because a car company has received the notification, not the, not the uh, car company, the rental company customer. Okay, yes. Um, I had understood, Mr. Bainwall, to indicate that notification was important. Right. Um, and, and we don't see that as a substitute for fixing the car. And as far as the um, cases that have been raised about so-called technical problems, you know, a lot of times what are seen as technical um, really aren't that technical. And, for instance, the notice on the visor. Um, in most vehicles these days, there's a notice on the visor that's very important for parents to see, and it says, danger, warning, um, do not have a child under a certain age or size sitting in the front seat because of the possible um, problems with airbags. And that's a federally mandated notice that, that goes on the visor, and if it's missing, um, it's, it's an important thing. Plus, it's illegal to sell that car in the first place. Um, and we believe that the manufacturers should comply with the federal safety standards. If they have a problem with the federal safety standards, come to Congress, come to NHTSA, try to change the federal safety recall system. That's not what this bill does. This bill does not change the existing federal safety recall system. It keeps it intact. And all it does is extend the existing system to rental car companies, including car dealers. That's all it does. And it, it doesn't overhaul the existing safety recall system. Basically what they're doing is complaining about the existing safety recall system and saying we shouldn't have to recall this, we shouldn't have to recall that. The, this is not the bill to have that debate about. This is a very simple, straightforward consumer protection measure. And we desperately need it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to say, Madam Chairman, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I hope we will be successful and I know working with you has, has been a, a real experience because you, because, because you're a no-nonsense senator. And, and I think what we heard today is a little bit of nonsense, to be honest with you. Well, I am, uh, I'm going to remain optimistic. We began this process with a lot of the rental car companies not on board. And we've been able to negotiate and work towards a solution that is, I think, a good one. And now I want to make sure that we work with the manufacturers and the dealers uh, to try, if we can, to address their concerns in a way that protects the integrity of the bill and with the overall goal of obviously protecting consumers. And so I will um, remain optimistic of that, about that. And Mr. Bainwall and Mr. Welch will look forward to working with you and your staffs to try to see if we can't figure out a way to address some of the concerns that you've expressed today without harming the integrity of the bill. I will tell you, Ms. Houck, that my uh, daughter will have her 24th birthday on Thursday, and her younger sister is 21. I cannot imagine the grief that you must feel each and every day. And so on behalf of all of my colleagues, we thank you for channeling that grief in such a constructive way with integrity and intellect and passion. And I know how proud your daughters would be of you. Thank you.